Welcome, my friends, to another edition of the Heritage Wealth Planning YouTube channel. Today, I want to talk to you about a question that came to me on Quora. I don't know if you ever visit Quora.com, but I'm on there quite a bit lately because I find it pretty interesting that uh, a lot of the questions they ask here, um, a lot of weird questions, actually, but uh, a couple that actually come to my mind that are pretty good and helpful for you to understand. So I'm going to share with you one of these questions, which, uh, which just came to me today. The nice thing is they can actually, the folks who ask these questions can actually address them to me or to you, whoever's on there. So you get a, a good list of questions on uh, things that are of interest to you. So I have stuff on USAA and Vanguard, uh, state planning, retirement planning, um, other things I'm interested in as well, ice hockey and things of that nature. But uh, but the ones that really get me fired up are things like this one right here, actually. Do, does a revocable living trust protect my heirs from paying any estate taxes? Um, a lot going on in that question. And so the first thing is to remember, an heir does not pay estate taxes. All right. So let's just say it's me. I'm the, the grantor of the trust or I'm the owner of the money and I want my kids to get my money. Uh, when they, when I die and leave it to my kids for an estate tax, I'm talking about the feds now, the heir doesn't pay any tax on it. All right. The heir doesn't pay estate tax. The estate, Josh's estate will pay the estate tax. So before the money makes it to my kids, it's the tax has already come out. Does that kind of make sense? So the heir doesn't get a bill later on and say, oh, you owe an estate tax, pay up. That, that's already been taken for before the estate can be settled. So very important to know that. Um, now, I'm going to take a side note here because this is something I talked about my answer to this guy, or uh, I'm not sure who actually asked that. But there is a tax the heirs pay when they receive an inheritance, and that's called IRD, income with respect to decedent. And that is essentially the all the accumulated tax that's been built up, or gains, I should say, that's been built up in your IRA, 401k, 403b, or annuity. All the gains that have been built up in there, someone's going to pay the tax on it at some point. It's either going to be you, your surviving spouse, or the kids. The only way there is no tax is if you leave those to a charity, a church, the boys club, something like that. So that's not an estate tax, all right? But that is a significant tax your heir is going to pay and will be subject to. And if you're not, and, and the funny thing is about this is about an estate tax doesn't really affect anybody more. There's, you know, will affect Warren Buffett, but it'll affect the average middle class America. No, you have to have an estate well over $12 million married filing jointly in order to be hit with a federal estate tax. So the estate tax is not a starter first and foremost, but the IRD tax, the income res res respect to the, the decedent, you can have $100,000 in your account and leave it to your son and your son's going to receive that 100 bucks, 100,000 bucks with, with a tax consequence for sure. And it still comes out as ordinary income tax, which means it's tax based on his ordinary income tax bracket. So if he's in a 22%, he's going to pay 22% of the taxes to Uncle Sam on the IRD. I don't even care if you don't have anything more than that one account, that $100,000, you will pay or he will pay, the recipient will pay tax on that IRD. Uh, for the love of me, I don't understand why that gets overlooked so much. People are so worried about estate tax when the big tax now is the income tax you pay on the deferred assets. 401k, 403b, IRAs, annuities, those are deferred assets. The income tax to your heir is gigantic and it has nothing to do with the size of your estate. But I, let's go into this revocable living trust. Now, again, rev, not again, but revocable living trust is still in your estate. All right. It's still the same Social Security number. Anything that you put in that trust, the income derived from that still flows back to you. A trust is just a holding account, essentially. It, it doesn't change ownership. You still own it. So if I have a, a, a trust account, revocable living trust, Josh Scanlon is a grantor. I granted the asset to the trust. And Josh Scanlon is a trustee to manage that trust. Josh Scanlon's a grantor. Josh Scanlon's a trustee. I can do whatever I want. Now, because of it, I still have unencumbered uh, ownership of it, which means I haven't given it away. Thus, if I die, it's still included in my estate because I own it outright. I haven't made a gift. I still have control over it. On top of that, as a grantor, I am the person who gives the, the money or the asset to the trust 
but because it's still under my control, it's not really a gift. There's no gift tax consequence. It still flows back to my social security and all that. I still have unencumbered control. So a revocable living trust doesn't change anything in terms of an ownership state. What it does is allows for someone to manage that account if I'm incapacitated or when I die. That, that, that's it. That's all a revocable living trust does. It allows for management at my incapacity or at my death through what's called a successor trustee. I am the, I'm the, the trustee of my trust until I'm incapacitated or I die, which I've named a successor trustee in my living trust document who will come and act on my wishes according to the trust document. But when I die, that trust becomes irrevocable. A living trust, revocable living trust, inter vivos trust, all the same thing. It becomes irrevocable at my death, which means it can't be changed. And so I have a lot of these trusts with clients I've seen. They drew up back I mean, 10, 15 years ago when a whole different estate tax law was in America than it is today. They haven't changed those trusts. They have successor trustees who are Uncle Bob, who's since that dead or maybe got addicted to crack cocaine or whatever. You know, that guy's still your successor trustee. That's the wrong answer, because at your death, that thing becomes irrevocable. It cannot be changed. Now, you might be able to get a court order to do that. I have seen that happen. That's not cheap, and it certainly doesn't happen very quickly. So if you have a living trust, you better get on the horn and make sure that thing is up to where you want to be, especially under the new laws that we have here today with a pretty significant estate tax exemption. All right. So I just want to be clear there. A living trust retains the asset in your estate. A living trust becomes irrevocable at your death, which immediately should say, I better make sure I have all my stuff in order in terms of who I want to be the trustee to manage that trust upon my death. On top of that, what I found a million times a Sunday is a living trust has been drawn up, but it hasn't been funded. And what that means, you have a trust drawn up, but there's no asset in the trust. So the grantor of the trust, me, hasn't granted anything in the trust for the trust to own it. An unfunded trust isn't worth the piece of paper, isn't worth this napkin here. It doesn't mean anything. There's nothing that happens. An unfunded trust is absolutely irrelevant. And if you have an attorney who drew you up a trust and isn't talking about funding the trust, making sure that puppy's been funded, you need to find a new attorney. Just met with a lady here on Friday, an estate planning attorney, and she charges a fee for that. And it's a valuable, valuable service she provides. She'll put your home in a trust. She'll put your accounts in a trust and whatnot. You know, she's going to charge you for it, but at least you know it's done. And if it isn't done because the attorneys are fiduciaries, you can absolutely hold her liable uh, for, for negligence. Well, I don't know if that's the right word. I don't know what the word would be, but you can hold her liable for not getting the job done as a fiduciary. She's supposed to. Um, and that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I cannot tell you how many trusts I've seen that have no assets in it. Now, lastly, you cannot put an IRA in a trust, all right? A trust is not a non-IRA account. An IRA, only you as an individual can own it. A trust cannot take ownership of an IRA. You can make a trust a beneficiary of your IRA. And I do have some qualms about that. Generally speaking, there's some reasons to do that. But uh, the vast majority of time, I don't believe you should. That'd be up for you to determine talking with legal counsel. I am not an attorney. I'm just a good old fashioned financial planner. But just keep that in mind. Putting a trust as a beneficiary of an IRA, uh, there are some circumstances where that's, where that make sense. And I won't get into it today. But generally speaking, the vast majority of time, I, I don't I don't think it makes sense. Um, now, on top of that, living trust is also in your state. It's, I just want to go back to that. Living trust is still in your state. Lastly, there are states, Massachusetts jumps out at me, uh, Pennsylvania, some states where they do, Massachusetts has its own estate tax, and the exemption there is only a million dollars. Uh, Pennsylvania actually has an inheritance tax, which is the one time in New Jersey as well, the one time that the heir will have to pay tax on the inheritance they receive. So each state is different. A lot of those states in the Northeast, Minnesota, with Governor Dayton, signed a pretty big uh, estate tax in the law, which the, everyone else is going away from estate tax, and Minnesota went the other way and signed a pretty significant estate tax in the law there as well. And so that's a big deal on top of the feds. So most people don't have to worry about the feds from an estate tax perspective. A living trust doesn't do anything anyway when we're, from an estate tax perspective. The state is really what you have to worry about from an estate tax perspective or an inheritance tax. Looking at you, New Jersey, looking at you, Pennsylvania, uh, state of Massachusetts or Commonwealth of Massachusetts. If you have an estate over a million dollars, it is subject to state of Massachusetts estate tax. 
a million bucks. That includes your life insurance. If you own it, it's in your estate, your home, your IRA, your life insurance, your investments, you name it, it's in your estate. So it doesn't take much to get over that million dollar threshold in Massachusetts. So just keep that in the back of your mind. The big thing that you have to contend with is your tax on IRAs. Income and respect and respect to decedent is the big bogey out there that some for some reason most people are not paying mind to. And and uh, going back to this answer, I told that person in this uh, Quora.com, that's really what they should be concerned with. All right. Hope this helps. Put questions down below. Give me a thumbs up for sure. Uh, comments. Don't hesitate to, to add on to it if you have anything you want to add. I mean, people read this stuff. And as always, as always, uh, don't forget to subscribe and then hit the notification bell to be notified of future content here at the Heritage Wealth Planning YouTube channel. Thanks, guys.